because there will be no guideline. There is no guideline. We become a bunch of people who will interpret and misinterpret whatever we want from any book that we want. It's very dangerous, and we must understand that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ensuring that His Prophet is codified, is validated, has the substantive matter that He brings evidence on the earth that humankind, no matter how reckless he is, has no option but to accept it. That is why today, if you look, why is Islam growing so rapidly? Always has been, I mentioned this before. Islam has not stopped growing from the day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, akmaltu lakum deenakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum al-islam Today, I perfect for you this religion as a mercy. We call it Islam for all of you mankind. And from that day onwards, Wallah, I say to you, Islam has not stopped growing because Allah's infinite mercy is in it. He has guaranteed it. He says, Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. So it's essential for us to understand that in this spectrum of six billion people in this world today, in today's world where the world is converging upon us, no one is pretty much blind about the truth of Islam. Observe, you will see it is spreading like fire, wildfire, and people know it. The continent of Africa has so many Muslims. It's the largest Muslim population on earth in a continent is the continent of Africa. How did it spread there? Just merchants who went down there doing business. And by observation and people seeing it, Islam was never spread with a sword in a generic sense of the word. There may have been some skirmishes here and there where one group of people or one particular group of authority violated the laws of Islam in its spreading. But that does not make Islam a religion that was spread with a sword. We should never accept that. For Islam is a religion of peace that spreads by itself because of its fundamental basis by which its logic of pure monotheism defies every concocted lie on earth. Where people have to say that we inherit the sins of someone or something is cooked up as a son or as a daughter or having relations, etc., etc. The human mind says that cannot be. I have my American friends who even before they heard of Islam, said, you're a Muslim, tell me what is Islam? When I say to them, he said, that's the religion I've been waiting for. For it, my mind has told me that this absolute God can have no relationship with the human being with regards to his corporeal form. And thus what you are saying is most correct. What is this spread of Islam? Observe, in my school as a young child, and I'm sure many of you living in Australia, I'm not sure whether it's prevalent down here, but in the US, it has been very prevalent. Where well, we've been constantly told that this religion, Islam, was spread with a sword. I remember when I was in seventh grade, there was a teacher. I distinctly remember this. Maybe that was the beginning of my public life in terms of being contentious and fighting for a cause. That my professor said, Islam is a violent religion and it was spread with the sword. This prophet of theirs went knocking at people's doors and he would chop people's heads off and tell them to be Muslims. Otherwise, he would cut their, you know, cut their heads off. And here I am in seventh grade, taken aback. I said, excuse me, what is this? I never heard of this. He says, oh yeah, that's how it is. I said, Mr. Birnbaum, I challenge you, you have made a big lie. He said, I'm a professor. I said, yeah, so? <laughs> <laughs> so he says, yeah, you think you're smart? Okay, you bring your books, I'll bring mine. I just put my foot in my mouth, of course. <laughs> I said, okay. So I left the class and I said, what am I gonna do? I've never read a book about Islam. <laughs> See. You're beginning to realize the value of your own faith at the hands of those who are claiming, you know, uh, you as a Muslim, me as a Muslim, 
We don't realize the value of our faith until we are placed in an environment where the environment begins to question the integrity of your own faith. But here it's not even questioning the integrity, it's giving me a smack on the face. So I went home and by Allah's grace, Allah has blessed us with a person we should remember him. His name is Sayyid Asghar Rizwi. He has passed away already. He has written a book. It took him 40 years to do a restatement of Islamic history and Muslims. An excellent book about the history of Islam. This man researched for 40 years to do this in trying to bring forth the real history of Islam. For we have inherited a lot of trash in history, unfortunately, which we have absorbed in thinking that it is fact. And this man, by Allah's grace, was so good. I said, listen, Sayyid, I'm in trouble here, you know. I need to protect myself. My uh, respect is on the line. He says, no problem. Go to the library, pick up this book, this book, this book. Pick up the book by General uh, Sir John Glubb. Open up page 287, you know, paragraph 3, you will see it there. Wow. I mean, someone's like, I hit the uh, computer, you know, search, and it gave me all the results. So I went to the library, went into the archives, and there these books were. I pulled them out, and exactly what it said. Christians who were in that region, historians like Sir John Glob, and I remember his name distinctly, says that Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, was Salawat ala Muhammad. was a peace-loving man, a man who promoted peace across the nations. And he, he gave protection to the non-Muslims, but the cost of that protection was jizya to try to collect some funds for they were not, they were exempt from going to war. Think about it, living in a country where a country has to go to war, you're exempt from it. You just have to pay and you're protected. What a mercy that our Prophet gave them that. So I collected these books and I went back. And the next day I went to class, I brought my five books, I put it on the table, I was all excited, you know, figured this is going to be a real big fight now. <laughs> and the kids loved it, by the way. That's one thing about kids, you know, they love, you know, they love these kinds of fights in class, don't they? You know? They don't have to study, they don't have to do anything, they can just fight for a cause, right? Salawat Allah, Muhammad wa Muhammad. So, he didn't even open the books. I said, Mr. Birnbaum, these are the books that I brought. Aren't you going to present it for what you said yesterday? He said, okay, so you brought your books. I said, well, I think we owe it to the class that they need to read some of these verses, some of these statements which contradict what you have said. So I went, alhamdulillah, and I read a few. He didn't like it, of course. He was biting his teeth all the time. But anyway, after that, I asked him a question. I said, Mr. Birnbaum, you're Jewish. He said, that's right. I said, you only have one period in your life which is known as the golden age. And he turned blue. <laughs> he said, yes. I said, I think, you know, I was like a prosecutor and I felt like a prosecutor. I said, would you like to tell the class what is the golden age? He says, well, since you're so smart, why don't you tell them? <laughs> You see, now he's putting me on the spot. I said, sure, no problem. I said, the Jews never in their history have been allowed to profess their faith freely to the public world, except when they were under the rule of the Muslims, under the Muslim empire. And at that stage, you have coined a period in Spain, under Cordoba, where you Jews were allowed to preach and practice your faith freely without any form of oppression. He said, that is correct. I said, Mr. Birnbaum, that doesn't make sense considering what you said before. I said, and final point, if somebody came to your door and knocked with a sword and told you, you become a Muslim, would you become one? Hey, if the sword is hanging on my head, sure I would. <laughs> I like my neck where it is. <clears throat> he said, yeah. I said, but if you took the sword away, would you believe in that faith? He said, no. I said, Mr. Birnbaum, 
1967 Time Magazine, 1972 Time Magazine, and backwards and forwards, the fastest growing religion in the world is Islam. I don't think these people are crazy enough to see a sword over their heads, for neither do I see a sword over my head. What's the problem? Why is Islam spreading so fast? For I certainly don't see a sword over my head. And he realized that point, we made the point, we move forward. But the important point was when I was graduating from that school, he called me and he said, no one has insulted me the way you have. <laughs> I said, correction, you insulted me first. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So we as Muslims living in this society today have to understand our duties and responsibilities, have to arm ourselves with sufficient knowledge. And that was sufficient by Allah's grace to come forward. You know, my, my friends in that class said, we have a lot of respect for what you have said. Now you never know. That child who was in that class who heard this kind of a conversation and it stuck in his head and tomorrow ends up becoming the president of a country, think of the effect one can have with positive movement in promoting the good and forbidding the evil. But we need to speak the truth, understand the value, and people are constantly trying to give the short end of the stick to our Holy Prophet Sallallahu because they are truly afraid of him. They are afraid of his revolution for it lives on. Do you know that today, according to the World Book of Records, the number one name is Muhammad. And it has been, and it will be. So let's not change our names from Muhammad to Mo, please, okay? <laughs> Muhammad is a beautiful name. Keep it. When my friends ask me, can I call you Harry? I said, my name is Hassanain. Oh, it's difficult. I said, then call me Hassan. <laughs> Call me Hussein, I have no problem, but don't call me Harry. No Harold, no Haas. <laughs> okay. Why do they want to shorten my name? Because it's a concerted effort. Remove his name. It's too much of a flag. Dilute him. So I always flip it the other way. I say, listen, you can't call my name? Don't call me. Because I'm not important. If I was important, you would mention my name properly. If I'm not important, don't call me. It's not important. I said, but since it's so difficult for you, maybe then you should consider my difficulties too. For your name, George, is very difficult. Ali is easier. <laughs> oh no, my name's George. <laughs> I said, your name is Bob. I said, that's right. Now, with all due respect, really, I don't know what Bob means. The only thing I know Bob is the thing which floats in water. But I don't know, maybe I got it wrong. But what does Bob mean anyway? In Islam, names that are given to us are meaningful. It has substance. It's a flag. It's a demeanor. We carry ourselves with a position. All the facets of a Muslim, if you look by the way he dresses and the way he walks and what he says and how he says it has an implication on his bearing for he is the cause of effects and he is the effect of causes. It's very essential for us to understand that we are not living in a vacuum. We are playing a very important role in this matter. And therefore it is essential for us to understand that our demeanor is extracted from the greatest personality that ever walked the face of this earth, i.e. Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam.